and um, field questions and like do discussion um, after that. Um, if you have any clarifications or um, points of contention, you can uh, message in the chat. I'll have it open and I'll try to address it as it comes up. Um, yeah. All right, um, let's begin. So in the uh, abstract, I, I, I titled this talk, Why Mathematical Logic, and sort of um, try to fo focus it on the story of uh, infinity and rigor in mathematics. Um, and, and I think this is helpful in framing why you might be interested in mathematics. Uh, mathematical, ma mathematical logic. Um, so, um, to begin with, I'll talk about um, sort of the frame of the question. Um, so, you, you might notice that the, the question isn't really a complete sentence. Um, we don't have a verb, we don't really have a subject. Um, so, let's try to specify what, what I mean. Um, so why does, would um, I, you, any particular person study mathematical logic? Uh, or we could ask, um, why do people in general care or are interested in mathematical, mathematical logic? Well, the first question is a bit subjective. It's doesn't really lend itself to being <laughs> communicated in an hour long talk. So I think um, I'll consider, uh, consider um, the second question instead. So there are a, po a few possible reasons that um, we could talk about. One is just practical applications outside of the fields that are close to it, namely math and logic. But this is not really my um, area of um, study, um, but I can sort of name some examples, um, you, you know, models of linguistics that involve um, certain aspects of for for formalisms, um, foundations for computer science, or um, more recently, like um, pre fighting or checking pr uh, programs that um, come out of um, things like homotopy type theory and etc. Um, another is how it relates to sort of ma mathematics um, at large, ordinary mathematics, as it were. There are a lot of interesting proofs that use methods that come from mathematical logic. Um, to name a few examples, um, applications from model theory um, include a lot of um, interesting um, proofs, uh, like Axel Grothendieck. Um, it's a statement about certain um, polynomial maps when they're um, bijective, um, and other applications in geometry, number theory. Um, Non-standard analysis is another top, another another field which kind of comes out of model theoretic methods mostly. Um, for set theory, there's lots of weird, um, interesting applications in the finite combinatorics. Um, we like to say set theory is the sort of study of in infinity. Um, but it turns out that set theoretic methods can prove, uh, can provide novel proofs for finite uh, theorems. And also more, what might, might be more familiar to a lot of people studying math is foundations for real analysis, like constructing the, the real numbers and um, uh, measure theory. And a lot of uh, introductory courses will at one point discuss um, sets of some kind. And there are philosophical motivations. Um, so when you talk about math mathematics or proofs, the objects in mathematics, um, how do we know that they are grounded or justified? How, like, how, 
how do, how can you say for certain that the things that we're talking about aren't just meaningless um, empty statements? Um, and the traditional discourse has been sort of a dichotomous between um, ontological viewpoints, like um, taking objects as sort of fundamental, like um, uh, you might be familiar with uh, mathematical Platonism, uh, or more of an epistemological uh, viewpoint, which is more concerned about um, how we know uh, the things we're doing are justified. And this is perhaps more close to um, formalist um, viewpoints. However, this distinction is perhaps not as important as you may think, um, even though it's the traditional way of thinking about it. Um, <laughs> a professor of mine once said that uh, um, this is kind of metaphysics in the disguise of mathematics. Um, and that's part partially fair. Um, so the second part of this talk is um, giving a brief history of uh, infinity and, and sort of the role is played in how we think about rigor in mathematics. So just, just to frame um, this, this story, how should we tell the story of the philosophy of mathematics? And I've already mentioned sort of the traditional framework, um, the various schools, Platonism, realism, formalism, etc. But um, while this is philosophically interesting, perhaps it's, um, like it's, it deals with metaphysical problems, and it's also pretty self-contained. You don't have to talk about things that are outside the traditional <laughs> philosophical tradition. It's pretty anachronistic. Um, it doesn't really deal with how um, mathematicians really do mathematics, how they think about the things that they deal with in their day-to-day -day life. Um, so for this talk, I uh, I opt for a more historicist viewpoint. Um, to borrow um, Thomas Kuhn's terminology, um, sort of paradigm shifts, um, reactions, and um, Sort of revolutionary uh, ideas in um, the, the history of mathematics. And this, the advantage in this is that it provides a lot of context for the debates that were going on in the philosophy of mathematics. And um, personally, I think it, um, it's, provides a, a lot more motivation for what, why one might be interested in mathem math mathematical logic beyond just subjective aesthetic um, viewpoints. But the disadvantage is that it can get a bit messy. Um, this is the case with most history of ideas. There's a lot of um, outside influences, um, be it religion, uh, uh, mythology. Um, um, so it's a bit unfortunate, but um, the way that a lot of people, including me, have been taught about this is pretty Eurocentric. So I won't be discussing uh, currents outside of the sort of Western canon, um, but it's also doubly problematic in that um, a lot of people talk about sort of the Greeks as if they were sort of monolithic and it's very historically inaccurate um, to say the least but um, it's the way that <laughs> it's the simplest way of conveying um, the history I think um, so what is infinity, uh, just breaking down, down to the word, it means without end or without limit. And um, what kind of, um, the most important thinker in this area in uh, the Greek tradition is Aristotle, um, in that 
a sort of post Greek thought in medieval and early Renaissance mathematics uh, and um, scholarship in general. He's uh, quite, <laughs> he looms in the background a lot. Um, and what Aristotle said was that actual infinity, um, objects that are uh, in themselves without end is pretty much impossible, but uh, potential infinities are possible, um, which is to say that um, you can talk about a sequence, for example, one, one half, or one fourth, and kind of like continue that and consider it going arbitrarily uh, long. But it's not really, he doesn't really consider the sequence as an object, but more of it as a process. And to quote from his physics, um, it's he kind of considers it self-evident that actual infinity is um, a contradiction in, ter in terms. And um, the more along the lines of, sort of the math, um, people like Euclid, uh, um, their mathematics of the infinite and the infinitesimal, mostly, and there are exceptions, um, could be done with uh, arbitrarily larger finite finite quantities. So um, one example of how this uh, plays out is the method of exhaustion, um, funny name, but um, it's an early method by which you could integrate by, um, say you want to, to prove that the area of a circle is um, uh, R squared, um, then you sort of inscribe them by polygons where, where you kind of know what the area is and squeeze it between two bounds until um, you, you get to that, that formula. And obviously this is kind of reminiscent of how uh, Riemann's integral work. Um, the difference is quite of kind of subtle, but um, for for both viewpoints, um, areas for like triangles and rectangles are pr pretty uh, are, are considered to be kind of self evident um, what they should be, and um, for other geometrical objects like um, lines and planes and that uh, um, we could think of as extended things to, in to infinity, they could all be sort of interpreted locally. There are exceptions, of course, that um, Pappus, um, a post-Euclidean mathematician, um, can wrote some things about projective geometry that um, kind of has to do deal with points of infinity, but um, that's, and that's the case with, the history in general, um, like Aristotle, uh, uh, for example, um, considers infinitesimals, and that's what we would get um, his principle um, uh, in terms of like real analysis and number theory. Um, we also have Zeno's paradox, um, like um, you have what uh, Achilles and a turtle racing with turtles um, some distance ahead and um, you consider each time Achilles catches up the the to where the turtle was last time the turtle has um, moved forward a bit so um, the paradox is that how can Achilles ever cat, like, um, surpass the turtle um, and those are early examples of um, infinities or infinitesimals being considered but um, Aristotle's viewpoint is what comes to predominate um, in later thought. Until sort of the late Renaissance, um, sort of 16th, uh, 17th century, um, when we get um, an, uh, an update on <laughs> integration, uh, the method of individuals. Let's consider, um, uh, Euclidean space, or R3, and a certain solid, um, which is bounded by the rotation of the graph um, uh, spanned by um, 1 over x around the x-axis, and the circle um, that's, you, you cut it off at x equals uh, uh, 
one and there's a natural big circle that bounds that. And you might be aware that this is um, obviously an unbounded object, but it has infinite surface area but finite volume. And Torricelli, who uh, defined this and also um, proved the results from it, um, used both the Greek method of exhaustion, which is finitistic. Um, he basically cuts off at uh, finite intervals and um, inscribes by, by um, cylinders. Um, and the method of the, the new method of indivisibles, which is um, considering infinitesimally s small sort of uh, planes. And um, it's also known by um, caval the name Cavalier's principle, and saying that um, by rearranging those infinitesimally thin planes, you can rearrange this as another cylinder you can measure the vol volume of, and that is finite. Now, if you're Aristotle um, and don't really consider actual infinities, this is a problem because. Um, if you interpret this statement about potential in infinities, then there is no paradox, but it's also very uninteresting. Um, and Torricelli showed that, um, that the solid has finite volume using finitistic methods. So the, the rigor of the proof, um, even if you reject the method of indivisibles, is pretty kosher. Um, now, uh, that sort of um, re revolutionary method leads to uh, the calculus that was developed by uh, Newton and Leibniz in the 18th century, I want to say. Um, now, it was revolutionary in many ways. You know, we all, all get taught calculus at some point in, in our lives, but it was the way that they did it was very unrigorous and had many ob objections from a wide, wide range of uh, thinkers. So the way that Newton did his calculus, um, the method of fluxions, um, it's very linked with physics and in, is a phrase in kinematic terms, sort of, um, flows and um, like ratios of flows. And Leibniz is similar, but it, it, more algebraic or arithmetical. Um, he relies on infinitesimal variables, dx, dy, and using algebraic manipulations to uh, come to uh, derivatives at dx over dy. Now, uh, if you take a review analysis, um, you know that this is pretty problematic, and um, it was pointed out pretty early on. Um, George Berkeley, um, he's a philosopher, mathematician, also theologian, um, in his analyst said that um, both of these are pretty uh, contradictory. Um, I forget exactly what he said about Newton's method, but um, at least for the Leibnizian method, um, he points out that these infinitesimals are sometimes taken to be zero when you're canceling out terms, or, or rather, um, uh, what do I want to say? So, uh, things like dx dy or dx squared um, are taken to be zero, but sometimes they're not taken to, take to be non-zero. Um, when you're casting them out by dividing um, dy, for example. And this is pretty nonsensical in a standard analytic uh, viewpoint. Um, you're, you're supposing two different things at once. Um, and um, just as a, as a sort of footnote, um, Kant has a few interesting th things to say about um, mathematics. Um, kind of from Berkeley and Hume's analysis. Um, and he, he says this 
thing. Mathematics is the, the synthetic a priori study of pure intuition of space time as a method of sort of um, trying to ground the calculus or, or mathematics in general in a uh, philosophical way. Um, but this will have a lot of objections from the ma mathematicians as well. So uh, now we have the 18th and 19th century project of trying to uh, ground re uh, the real number system or calculus uh, for that matter. Um, the philosophical objections that um, Newton's and Leibniz's calculus were fairly unrigorous and um, uh, not grounded led to an active field of research at the time, um, led by um, people like Bolsano, Tetkin, Cauchy, Weierstrass. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention two of these. Um, Bolsano's uh, proof of the intermediate value theorem. And he, he the original proof he, um, in the introduction, he goes on a pretty lengthy tirade against the proofs of the time. Um, he explicitly rejects sort of the Newtonian um, method of kinematic or temporal arguments and proof, and this is also tied to his rejection of Kant's philosophy of mathematics. And this is also where we first see the use of the least upper bound property as um, a remedy, as a, a, a method of proof. And um, if you take an undergraduate analysis class, this will be familiar, um, the Dedekind construction of the reals. This is, um, along with Cauchy, uh, kind of the, the two most common <laughs> way that this is th taught. Um, and what he does is um, consider um, cuts of the rational numbers, which are sets that, that um, are based on certain axioms, basically, um, uh, you can think of the real numbers and um, consider the set of everything less than, say, x, and um, that is the cut defined by x. And you can reverse engineer that from the rational numbers, and um, the cuts sort of define x. Um, and this is a kind of uh, um, a predecessor to set theory. Like this method of construction requires um, talking about infinite sets, another instance of actual infinities. Um, and Cauchy's method is, is no matter for that ma ma matter. Um, and it's also a, 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 an example of the abstraction principle. Um, Dedekind himself doesn't consider the real, real numbers are as a set of Dedekind cuts, but rather an abstracted set. It, it, uh, if you know mathematical platonism, this is quite Platonistic. Um, an abstracted um, set which is isomorphic to um, the Dedekind set, a Dedekind cut construction. And we get to uh, the development of set theory um, in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, and Cantor is kind of the most famous name in this. Um, his methods in many ways are how set theorists uh, prove a lot of things. Um, uh, hopefully uh, sometime soon we'll discuss um, the diagonal method, but predecessors in include Dedekind and Frege. Um, but um, there are others like um, Russell, but um, I'll focus on these for to inform our discussion about rigor. Dedekind, we already mentioned, um, he, he has to use infinite sets. Um, so going off that, he uh, wrote um, the foundations of the theory of numbers, where uh, he tries 
he conceives of his previous construction of the reals as sort of purely arith arithmetical in nature, because um, it's all from the rational, rational numbers. Um, and this leads him to try to, to ground the natural numbers um, in a sense, uh, um, uh, in a rudimentary set theory. But um, to consider the natural number system as an object, we need to really prove that infinite sets exist. Um, and um, I, I won't go through the proof <laughs> in detail, but like, suffice to say, like, this is this would not pass the set test of rigor for a lot of modern mathematicians. Um, what he considers is um, the, the sort of the collection of thoughts that one can have and say that um, the thought of thoughts, the function thinking of is um, a, uh, an injective or a one-to-one -one function from the realm of thoughts to the realm of thoughts, um, but um, it is um, there are objects in the realm of thoughts that um, are not in the image. And that's how he shows that there are infinite sets. Um, so in, in counter to this sort of very psychologistic um, methods of proof, Frege tried to ground arithmetic um, and numbers in general um, as arising from logic. Um, and the way he do does this, um, he outlines this in the book of shift to um, ideography and um, where he, that's kind of hit the first example where we see um, any sort of um, uh, what do I say? That's the first time um, that we see predicate logic um, as opposed to sort of Aristotelian logic. Um, we, we could also call that first order logic. But going off that, um, he uh, exposes it to uh, a purely logical, like um, just from logical laws like um so uh, not so but um you have predicate logic and um a, a metaphysical dichotomy between objects and concepts and what he tries to say is that numbers are attributes of concepts and he says zero is the concept that um is the concept that describes the concept um, uh, of emptiness. Um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, phrasing slightly. Um, you can already tell this is pretty complicated. Um, it's not that it, it's philosophically loaded, but it's also just flat out contradictory because the way he d does this um, in the basic laws, um, is introduce um, an axiom of unrestricted comprehension, um, basic law five in, in, in his text. Um, and Russell points out that this um, leads to paradoxes. Um, and if you're trying to do mathematics on a logical basis and you have uh, paradoxes or contradictions, that's a you can see that this is a project that goes, kind of goes nowhere. Um, although um, I have to say um, there are neologists nowadays um, trying to fix this with, with by going to like second order arithmetic, but um, that's a discussion that we can have another time. Now we arrive to Hilbert. Um, and what's sometimes called formalism, um, which is kind of an unfair descriptor. It's almost an epithet that his opponents um, 
gave him of it. Um, so we have Hilbert's program, um, and what he tries to do is arrive at a, a formal description of mathematics um, that uh, is complete in the sense that um, the formal system can prove its own consistency, so that all the sort of epistemological concerns about um, our mathematical proofs being kind of empty statements is resolved, but um, uh, it's also a project to um, achieve a compromise between um, the finest uh, schools, the constructionist, intuitionist, sort of led by Kronecker, um, Brouwer, and the new uh, Cantorian set theory that that emerged, uh, which um, talked about infinite sets in a way that scientists, for uh, um, various reasons, um, were very uncomfortable with. They thought it was not rigorous. Um, it the problem of like, uh, empty statements, essentially. And he, he, he does this sort of trichotomy, um, three levels of mathematics that uh, interact with each other. Um, we have the ordinary mathematics, the kind of uh, what you find in the math department, um, and the formalization of that is Mathematical math, mathematics in the proper sense. Um, you, you remember uh, Frege, like um, formal systems. You, you try to encode the ordinary mathematics in a formal system, but a priori, the formal system itself is uh, um, semantically null. It doesn't necessarily mean, uh, it, it doesn't refer to. Uh, objects, whatever sense you take object to be. And um, the way that you connect these is via uh, metamathematics. Um, you try to um, rigorously prove theorems by manipulating mathematics in the proper sense, using methods that um, go even beyond the finitist in terms of how restricted it is. Um, I won't go into too much depth, but um, intuitionists, um, they admit certain infinite objects um, as long as it is constructible or, um, yeah. For Hilbert, the metamathematical meta proofs have to, have to be, have to only concern finite things. Um, and this project, at first sight, is promising. You know, it's a good compromise. Um, you you try to rigorously show that um, the proofs are uh, any everything that you use in the proofs, everyone can agree on because it's all finite. But you try to uh, encode sort of the richness of ordinary mathematics by depriving the formal system of uh, any meaning and sort of assigning it. However, it, it's in one sense a failure. Um, in the 30s, um, Gerdolf proves his incompleteness theorems, um, which imply that um, if you're trying to do arith arithmetic, um, <laughs> to talk about numbers, any formal system that can encode that cannot prove um, it's self-consistency, um, assuming that it is consistent to begin with. Um, but there is a lot of, uh, it's not a total failure in the sense that this project, this program led to the emergence of proof theory, uh, as well as a lot of offshoots in mathematical logic in general, not all of it, but um, things like um, computer Butter theory, um, what, um, excuse me, um, 
things like um, Turing uh, machines, the, the methods all stem from um, the ultrafinitist viewpoint that Hober took to um, define meta mathematics, and that say, um, the, the method of sort of formalization and assigning meaning to sort of empty syntactic statements is also influential in model theory. Um, I didn't have quite the time to organize slides for um, the third part of the talk, um, how this all ties into uh, um, mathematical logic or met mathematics um, as it is taught and um, done today. Um, I uh, find <laughs> I thought that um, I'd go much longer, but I guess there were since there were no um, questions. Um, I can sort of jump in between slides and talk about how these things, the history is important to um, motivations and the practice today. Um, but before that, I think let's just um, open it up to <laughs> questions. If there are no questions, I, I guess I can just um, jump in between slides and uh, talk about that. Um, oh. ah. <laughs> so, I guess I'll. Kind of uh, breeze through um, s s some of the developments of set, set three um, stuff. Um, Frege's logicism, I mentioned that um, at, at least in sort of the more philosophical um, aspects of mathemat mathematical logic, there, there was a new logicist school. Um, basically, what it involves is instead of working purely in um, a first order logic and try to include arithmetic there, um, you go one level beyond that, second order logic. First order logic, um, you can quantify over variables that are sort of elements in your universe, but you can't really talk about quantification over functions or relations or su subsets. Um, uh, if that sounds weird um, in terms of set theory, the, the, the set theory, the universe is sort of like a, a V, it's the, it's a class, it's not a set, so you can talk about functions, but you have to talk about like divine of, um, the class of functions is a definable class, but it's not a set, for example. Um, but this, the advantage of, of talking about quantifying over uh, functions um, sets is that it, it allows for a lot, lot more proving a lot more things in the formal system however it's very li limited in the sense that the, you, you can be talking about um, formal systems that don't have models um, but it is a theorem um, uh, sometimes called Frege's theorem, that, that um, if you interpret the basic laws as um, second-order statements, um, this, if you add one axiom called Hume's principle, you can sh show that um, 
the natural number system or arithmetic is consistent. But again, you have to do some work to show that um, what, you're, what you're trying to do like in terms of constructing the natural numbers, you, you can sort of get around that problem of maybe not having any models. Um, and what I mean by structuralism here, um, remember um, Dedekind doesn't consider R to be the set that he constructs from Dedekind cuts, but like an abstraction from that. Um, and what structuralism means is sort of taking that viewpoint, um, for example, when you talk about the natural numbers being a subset of the rational numbers and the rational numbers being a subset of the real numbers, um, if you're doing set theoretic constructions, um, you, you do have to be careful because um, certain constructions may not allow you to, to say Q is a subset of R, um, but rather there is a copy of Q, um, which by all means is like isomorphic to Q, the construction of Q in R. So the, the advantage of structuralism is that you can, let's just say N is in Q, Q is in R without having to sort of instantiate these sets. But uh, there are problems like, what are the abstractions? Um, once you consider like what kind of objects they are, if you're if you're concerned about grounding them, um, there are some problems that you have to work around there, um, and this relates to category theory. theory. Um, there are ways of grounding them in as uh, foundational um, using like Topos theory and stuff. But um, a priori, it's not clear that um, the, the objects that you talk about in category theory uh, are, you can accept them as um, good objects to talk about, that they're, they're not just, um, uh, just dots and arrows as um, they can be sometimes talked about. Um, oh yes, and um, in the Discord, um, I, I said, um, I said a bit something a bit foolish, which is you know um, people don't really care about foundations anymore. But but that's not true. They, they, people do care. Um, the whole thing about homotopy type theory, um, um, Tertobus theory, those kind of things are alternative foundations for the usual ZFC set theory. Even within the set theory, there are um, other formulations. <laughs> Yeah, um, but uh, th they're all sort of different viewpoints, I think, and not necessarily things that are uh, replacements of each other. I don't like, um, there's nothing, Gettle's inconvenience theorems are liable to a lot of misinterpretation, um, let's just say. Um, but I have a feeling that um, whatever foundations you're trying to, to arrive at, you're not going to be able to achieve what Helbert intended, um, sort of encode all of the mathematics within a formal system that prove this own consistency. That's not good, really. Um, going to be possible, at least within the mathematical methods that we use. But 
there are certain disadvantages and advantages to different formal systems. I have uh, the, the sort of set theoretic method, whilst it allows for talking about various infinite sets, um, it's also, there's a lot of things that uh, are independent from the normal axiom of, of set theory. And if you're a mathematical realist or a Platonist, that can be pro somewhat, somewhat problematic. Um, you do have to do some work to try to argue that there are certain theorems that are independent fr from the normal axioms you should believe in. Um, but if you're, say, a fictionalist, you, you think that the mathematics or formal system is just a set of conventions, that's not necessarily a problem. But there's also, like, if your concerns are more fundamental, like using infinitary methods, um, and whether or not they, they can be counted as rigorous, the, um, you have to resort to things like um, type theory um, or certain type theories. Um, the um, mentioned um, constructivism and intuitionism um, and uh, for a long time, sort of in the late late nineteenth um, late nineteenth and early twentieth century. Um, People thought that um, this loses too much about mathematics, but you, you can. Oh, um, uh, people like uh, Martin Leff, um I'm blanking on not one of Brower's disciples, but um, people did for, for, um things that he might have approved of, like um, formally including the, the logic that um, intuitionism, for example, entails and deriving type theories or logics based on that. And that also um, is like a sister project to modal logics and other non-classical or non-first um, predicate logics that are quite interesting. And um, the the predicate logic is kind of unnatural if you think about it. It doesn't really accord with how we, uh, how our natural language works, how, how um, linguistically, uh, how we talk about objects, how we talk about truth statements. Um, so that's another big area of uh, mathematical logic or, or logic in general. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it for <laughs> what I wanted to say. Um, that's, if there are no more questions, I think we can call that a day. <laughs> Thanks, Marissa. <laughs>